Well, after the Battle of Waterloo, when Napoleon was finally defeated, the old French family were restored to the throne, the Bourbon kings. And uh, it was said of them that they had learned nothing and they had forgotten nothing. In other words, they came back and they um, took all the trappings of uh, royalty upon themselves and uh, they uh, cared nothing for the poor and they committed the very same mistakes that had caused the French Revolution in the first place. And eventually, 1848, they were thrown out for good. And as we look at these chapters of Mark, the next several chapters of Mark, we shall see something similar in the attitude of the Jewish religious leaders, the chief priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, and so forth. They have learned nothing from the prophets, nothing from John the Baptist, nothing from the Lord Jesus Christ himself, and they have forgotten nothing of their sinful and God-denying ways. So, here we are in uh, verse 12. Jesus has been round the, uh, to Jerusalem. He's gone into the temple. He's looked round. And then he goes out to Bethany uh, with the twelve. And Bethany was a village just outside Jerusalem, a uh, fairly short walk. Uh, and more particularly, it was where the Lord Jesus' friends, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, lived. Uh, so it was natural that he should spend the night there. And we see that uh, the next day as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Why was he hungry? Well, I assume that he wanted to get to Jerusalem early while the money changers and the, the animal uh, salesmen and so forth were still setting up. Uh, so he skipped breakfast. But again, why was he hungry? Why was he hungry? Uh, because he was a man. Because he was a man. He was man as if he were not God. Um, he, he had the same human needs and, and, uh, and frailties that we have. And uh, he needed food for his sustenance. Hebrews 2 and verse 17. Um, for this reason, he had to be made like his brothers in every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God. And because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are themselves are being tested. Now, so he is man, man as if he were not God. Uh, but he goes to this fig tree to see if there's any fruit on the fig tree. And um, I am, my knowledge of botany and biology could be written on the back of a very small postage stamp. But I am told by those who know such things that the fig tree, unusually amongst fruit trees, uh, bears leaves and fruit at the same time. And uh, therefore, uh, al although it was early for figs, uh, when one sees a fig tree covered in leaves, it is a reasonable assumption that there might be early fruit on it. So the Lord Jesus goes to the fruit tree, and he looks, and uh, lo and behold, leaves it has a plenty, fruit it has none. It promised much, but it delivered nothing. And we need to understand what follows uh, is both a miracle and it is a parable. First of all, it's another proof that Jesus was God, is God, that he is God as if he were not man. He does not pray to the Father to curse the fig tree. He himself speaks the words and it is done immediately, as we shall see a little later. Uh, he is God as if he were not man. Uh, but also we need to understand that the Lord Jesus did not just get the hump because he couldn't find anything to eat. Not at all. He is making a point and we need to understand it. And it is the same point that Isaiah was making in the, uh, in the reading that we heard earlier. God looks for fruit. And this pretentious fig tree, all leaves, no fruit, uh, is a figure of the temple where we shall see lots of bustling quasi-religious activity but precious little in the way of sincerity or truth. And uh, the, uh, the acted parable that Jesus is giving here um, is, is preceded by the words, uh, first of all, of, of John the Baptist. When he, um, when he sees the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming towards him, he says, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not say to yourself, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you, out of these stones, 
God to raise up children for Abraham. The axe is at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. We also have another parable of the Lord Jesus on the same subject, uh, Luke 13 and verse 6. He told a parable, a man had a fig tree, planted his vineyard and went to look for fruit on it, but he didn't find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and I haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it come, uh, use up the soil? Oh, sir, the man replied, leave it alone one more year and I'll dig round it and fertilise it and if it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. So, uh, I wonder if this, this uh, fig tree does not speak uh, of many churches in our own day. Uh, uh, in Revelation chapter 3, the church in Sardis, you have a name that you are alive, says the Lord Jesus, but you are dead. Lots of activity, lots of stuff going on. But the word of God is not preached and the people are unaffected. Be in no doubt, God will bring down churches that act in this way. And that is not a reason for us to feel proud and think we're better than them and be self-satisfied, but to fear and to be on our guard lest we ourselves go the same way. But uh, to have baptisms, church membership, Lord's Supper, these things are leaves. These things are leaves. If there is no fruit, if we are not growing in the Lord Jesus Christ, if we're not producing that fruit of the Spirit that we saw earlier, if people are not being saved, coming into the church, then the church is like the fig tree. Blow to leaves, no fruit, under a curse. So, uh, verse 15, uh, Jesus comes into the temple and uh, he drives out the people who are selling and buying all, all these things. Now, clearly this is a sort of miracle of sorts, isn't it? Because Jesus, the Lord Jesus is one man. There must have been 30, maybe 40 people involved selling uh, selling, selling the animals to sacrifice, doing the money changing and this and that, and one man comes in and turfs them all out. And not one of them turns around and says, you're not moving me, mate. He has authority beyond that of a man, doesn't he? And the next thing we need to note is that this is the second time that the Lord Jesus has done this. In uh, John chapter 2, we read that he did very much the same thing, turfed them all out, and... Uh, uh, right at the start of his ministry, and the, and the priests and so forth were not very happy then. They didn't like it, they didn't like it then, but uh, they, they sort of put all the things back, and uh, the people came back, and they went on exactly the same as if nothing had happened. And now, a couple of years later, the Lord Jesus comes out and turns them all out again. And they're even less happy now, aren't they? And they say, this man's got to go. They looked around to see how they might, uh, began looking for a way to kill him. And uh, the first time they might have thought, who is this upstart guy messing up our nice temple? But the next time, this time, they had seen the miracles, they had heard the teaching. You might have thought that at least they would have listened to him. Perhaps we ought to hear what this guy is saying to us. But no, quite the opposite. They thought he's got to go, they look for a way to kill him. And at the very time, at the very time that the Jews were looking uh, were preparing to kill the Passover lambs, the scribes of the Pharisees are preparing to kill the true Passover lamb. And uh, very serious this, 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 this is. And, and what, what is the reasoning? What's the reasoning behind this? Well, what, what are these chief priests doing and so forth? Well, they liked their position. They liked the kudos. They liked the authority of their position. And they were not prepared to, uh, to in, in any way to accept Jesus as an authority. Uh, the, Jesus himself says, Matthew 23, everything they do is for men to see. They make their phylacteries wide, the tassel of their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets, the most important seats in the synagogue. They love to be greeted in the marketplace and have men call them rabbi. They didn't want to lose their position. They weren't prepared to accept the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you want to bring that into the present day, you may do so. I couldn't possibly comment. Um, so, why was this stuff going on in the temple? And why was it so offensive to the Lord Jesus? 
because it was all about money making rather than prayer, worship and teaching. The animals for sacrifice should have been sold outside uh, rather than inside and make, making the whole place look and smell like a farmer's market. Um, people, people were allowed to bring their own animals but uh, if, if they did so, the, the priests apparently were quite likely to say, well, this one's not good enough. We're not accepting it. So it was simpler and easier for the people coming to buy these animals at inflated prices uh, because they then knew that they would be accepted. And uh, the, uh, the temple uh, only accepted Jewish currency. So if you come a long way from uh, somewhere as a, as a proselyte, um, come from miles away to worship at the temple, you had to pay to change your money, and again, you were being fleeced by uh, the money changers. And of course, with all the animal noises and all the hubbub going on and the smells and what have you, where would anyone find a quiet spot to pray? And where was the teaching? And if you want to bring this up today, you can, need look no further, I think, than some of the great cathedrals in our land, and it, it will cost you maybe eight to ten pounds to get in the place, uh, which may give you a free candle that you can light, uh, which is nowhere required in the word of God, and you can buy postcards, calendars, arts and crafts, and what have you. But at the same time, you will be jolly fortunate if you find any, uh, anything much to bring you nearer to Christ. I will tell you a story which is absolutely true. Uh, a friend of mine who was in the Gideons for a number of years, um, well, it was a chap who suddenly felt that he needed to become a Christian. And he thought, how do I go about this? And he thought, well, I'll go to HQ. So he went to Exeter Cathedral. And he went up to the first chap who was um, there, who, who looked sort of formal, dressed in you know, whatever they dress, hassocks or whatever. And um, cassocks, not hassocks. And um, he said, excuse me, I'd like to become a Christian, please. Tell me how to do it. And the chap said, oh, oh, right, yes. Hold on a minute. And he went away and he brought someone even more well-dressed to teach him. He said, how, how, can I, how, how can I help you? I'd like to become a Christian, please. He said, oh, all right, yes. Um, right, hold on a minute. And he brought another chap in. And uh, eventually he said, well, I'm ever so sorry, but we don't really do that sort of thing here. Go up to St. Leonard's Church and I'm sure they'll be able to help you. <laughs> and I'm pleased to tell you he did go to St. Leonard's Church and they did help him. But uh, that... Uh, this is, this is what uh, goes on in, in some of these uh, places. Um, anyway, so what does this tell us, what does this tell us uh, about the worship also that God requires? Now, I, I, do not, I do not say at all that we need to be sort of miserable and po-faced uh, about, uh, about our worship but, uh, in church, but we need to understand that we are coming into the presence of Almighty God. Ecclesiastes 5 and verse 1 says, Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go near to listen rather than to offer a sacrifice of fools who do not do, know that they do wrong. So to guard your steps, what does that mean? It means to be conscious of where you are. If you had an audience with the Queen, you would be told what to wear, how to bow or to curtsy, how to address Her Majesty, and so on and so forth. Now, we have an audience with someone far more important, with greatest respect to Her Majesty, far more important than she. Uh, but man looks at the outward appearance, God looks at the heart. We shouldn't worry so much whether our shoes are sufficiently clean or what have you. We should look and see that uh, we have we come to church with a heart that is prepared for worship. Beware of going into the house of God uh, with our hearts full of the world and offering merely formal services. Uh, leave, let us leave our, our, our business worries, our money concerns and all the rest of it at home. And the sacrifice of fools, what's that? Sacrifice of fools is ignorant or worldly worship. Now I read somewhere about a man who was invited to dinner at one of the old Oxford colleges and um, uh, he was then asked to say grace and was told that it had to be in Latin. Uh, since he knew nothing about God or Latin, uh, he wasn't quite sure what to do, so he stood up and intoned, Homo lux domestos brobax ajax. Amen. <laughs> and he sat down. And, and, and no one paid any attention, and no one noticed anything amiss. <laughs> but 
if this is a true story, and I, I heard it, I can't vouch for its truthfulness, but if it is a true story, there was one who noticed, and God is not mocked. And uh, Hebrews chapter 12, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. So, the next day, uh, the disciples and the Lord Jesus coming up to the temple again, and they see this fig tree once more, and, and already it's shriveled up from the roots. Uh, now, usually, if, if a tree dies, the first, or is dying, the first sign you see is the leaves turning brown and so forth. But here, the process has been hugely accelerated. Um, it, 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 it has died. But uh, when a tree dies, it doesn't fall down immediately, does it? It stays there. And it may last in there a number of years till someone finally takes an axe to it or it keels over in a, in a gale. And... Uh, this is the situation with the temple. This is God's judgment upon this temple. Although it lasted there for another 40 years, and although the services and the sacrifices and all the other paraphernalia went on and on, God wasn't there anymore. This is, is, is an is, is a act of judgment by the Lord Jesus Christ. The same stuff goes on, but the glory has departed. Ichabod written over the top, and eventually in AD 70, the Romans came and raised the whole thing to the ground so thoroughly that some of the ancient writers found it hard to believe there'd ever been anything there at all. Uh, very solemn, this is. Are there churches today that have been abandoned by God for their unfaithfulness, but the people don't know it yet? I think there may be. What should our attitude be? Again, Romans 11, 29, be not high-minded, but fear. But now the conversation takes another turn, and the disciples are terribly impressed by this fig tree uh, dying, and uh, they, they, they think this is, this is, this is tremendous. And uh, they say, wow, look at that. How, do, how did you do that, teacher? How did you do that, teacher? And uh, you see what he says. Uh, Have faith in God, Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. If anyone says to this mountain, Go and um, hurl yourself into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes what he says will happen, it will be done for him. Well, that would be a good trick, wouldn't it? But uh, um, I don't think uh, too many of us have ever actually managed to do that. Um, Woodbury uh, Beacon is still there. I haven't gone to the middle of uh, the, S the, the ex estuary. And surely, surely we understand uh, that, this is, uh, that this is imagery. That, that the talk of the mountain being cast into the sea is, is figurative. And uh, the Lord is alluding to uh, a verse in uh, Zechariah chapter 4. Uh, uh, um, the Lord says to me, This is the word of the, God, of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. What are you, O mighty mountain? Before Zerubbabel you will become level ground. You will bring out the capstan with shouts of God bless it. God bless it. So um, some of us will remember uh, a couple of years ago, I suppose it was, uh, that we went through uh, the books of Haggai and Ezra. And we recall that Zerubbabel was the leader of the, uh, the, the Jews that had come back from uh, Babylon to rebuild the temple. And they had all sorts of problems, all sorts of difficulties. There are all sorts of enemies against them. And it must have seemed to Zerubbabel that these problems, these difficulties were as high as mountains. He could see no way of getting them right. And uh, the word from Zechariah is that they will be overcome. That the, the problems as big as mountains. And eventually, sure enough, the thing was finished and no literal mountains were moved. Uh, this is uh, the, the meaning of our Lord's words. I have no doubt at all. And uh, uh, God will honor believing prayer. And uh, we, we go to the, uh, the heroes of faith in, uh, in, in Hebrews chapter 11, don't we? Well, what more shall I say? I don't have time to say, tell you about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, gained what was promised, shut, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and so forth. Uh, God will honor 
believing prayer. But um, the promise presupposes that a believer will ask for the things that uh, are not sinful and are in accordance with God's word. Um, many years ago, I was taught five biblical conditions of answered prayer, and I, I think I may have mentioned them here before, but uh, here they are for you again. You may jot them down if you wish. Five principles of answered prayer. Uh, the first one is in very small print up there, so I'm going to turn around here. I tell you the truth. My Father will give you whatever you ask in your name. The first principle is that we ask in the name of Jesus. And this is not just something gabbled at the end. But uh, Jesus is our King and our Lord. We ask in his name. Secondly, uh, we ask with pure motives. Our motives need, need to be pure when we come uh, to, to the Lord. We need to be asking things which are righteous. Uh, James chapter uh, 4 and verse 3 says... Um, you do not have because you do not ask God, but when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your, your pleasures. Uh, we ask with pure motives. And uh, 1 John 5.14 is the confidence we have of approaching God if we ask anything according to his will. He hears us. Ask for things that we know are in the Lord's will. If we ask God to, to, uh, to, to, to save sinners, we, we have a reasonable expectation that these things are in the Lord's will. But uh, there are unanswered prayers in the Bible. Uh, Paul had a thorn in the flesh, didn't he, which is probably arthritis or something like that, I expect. But he asked, um, um, he asked the Lord to take this away three times. And the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you the prayer wasn't answered and of course the Lord Jesus Christ himself prayed if, if it be your will may this cup pass from me yet nevertheless not as I will but you will and of course um, it was necessary for Jesus to suffer and die that uh, God's justice should be satisfied and uh, uh, sinners set free and then we come the next one we need to do that do we uh, this is the very one we're looking at now uh, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and, uh, and, and you will receive it. And uh, James has something to say on that as well, doesn't he? He said, when you are, the, the, if anyone lacks wisdom, let, he ask God, let him ask God for it. But he has to believe. If, if he doesn't believe, he's an unstable man in all his ways, he needn't expect that he will see, receive anything from the Lord. And then finally, Luke 18, verse 1. Uh, we should always pray and not give up. God, God does not immediately answer prayer. Uh, Abraham and Sarah have probably been asking for a child for 40, 50, 60 years and not received one. Uh, but eventually uh, they did. We need to keep praying. We should always pray and not give up. And then we see that the Lord Jesus adds another condition. condition uh, verse, verse 25. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone... Forgive him uh, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. And this, this is nothing else but uh, the Lord's Prayer, isn't it? Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. We must have no malice in our hearts towards our fellow man. Uh, let, us, let us end, perhaps, here with, with a little bit of serious self-inquiry. Do you know what it is to be of a forgiving spirit? Can we overlook insults? and injuries that, that we inevitably receive from time to time. Because if we can't, it is no use being surprised if our prayers remain unanswered. So, uh, there we have it. To sum up very quickly, let us seek to be increasingly like our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ and imitate him in our ways. And let us not be like the fig tree, all appearance and no performance. Let us come to church in a sober and serious frame of mind, eager uh, to, to praise, eager to learn. And let us pray with faith for things that will honour God. And let us forgive those uh, who have wronged us and seek to be reconciled with them. But these are things, let me say once, for people who are already Christians. If there's anyone here today who doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ, don't think to yourself, well, I'll, I'll do all these things and then I'll be a Christian. 
No, no, you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And then you live a life of, of thankfulness and gratefulness, um, seeking to do the Lord's will and, uh, and fighting temptations and, uh, and indwelling sin. Now, there is no doubt that God has been blessing this church over the past few years. And uh, we should not take that blessing for granted. But I believe that if we will take heed to God's word and obey it, we shall continue to see blessing, more growth, more joy in the times ahead. Amen.